the people, the headlines, the issues impacting you and your family. This Week in Cincinnati on 9 on Your Side. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to This Week in Cincinnati. Well, with just over a week until Election Day, today we are focusing on the race for Ohio's second congressional district. And today we are speaking with the two major party candidates in that particular contest. They are incumbent Republican Brad Wenstrup and Democrat Jill Schiller. Congressman Wenstrup is seeking a fourth term in the House. The second district, by the way, covers a very diverse area. We're talking from Green Hills through Hyde Park to the east side in rural Pike and Adams counties, and about 724,000 people live in that district. We do begin with the incumbent, Congressman Wenstrup. Thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. We record this on Friday afternoon. At this moment in time, we have had multiple bombs, at least a dozen sent to mm -hmm. uh, many people. You have come out saying that you condemn this, um, and there is a suspect. We This seems clear that someone is angry mm -hmm. with Democrats are people who are, uh, you know, who have been criticized by President Trump. A lot of anger and fear right now. So what can you do as a congressman to bring down the temperature in this country? Mm -hmm. Well, all I've asked people to do is be calm. And also for me in particular, I try to lead by example. You know, one of the things that Paul Ryan said after Steve Scalise was shot and you had Republicans targeted on the baseball field, he came out on the floor and he said, an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And, and I believe that. Now that rhetoric that, that uh, we saw before that attack and then that went away for a couple days didn't last very long. Uh, we, we started seeing the divide once again very clearly. And you know, I don't think that rhetoric should give anyone an excuse for behavior like shooting at us at a baseball field or what we've seen this bomber do. Um, but I just, for me in particular, I try to lead by example. I can have debates with my counterparts in Congress on the other side of the aisle. But that doesn't mean I, I, don't, I don't like them. You know, I told someone once before, I didn't go to Washington to hate people. You know, I served in war with, with my fellow Americans. I promise you we were from different sides of the aisle throughout our unit, but we were one team. And it's an experience I wish more Americans had today. But we have a problem with violence in our country across the board, as we know. And we need to address that very sincerely and take a look at ourselves as a society, why we're seeing so much of it. I, then let's talk about violence in our mm -hmm. country. Is there anything you would support as far as um, you know, amendments regarding guns, gun control? Mm -hmm. What would you be willing to do? So we have done some things. We, we passed in the House and, and moved along the Stop Violence Act, which is signed. And uh, that will empower people to make their schools more safe. I think that's very important. One of the bills I signed on to recently talks about threat assessment. The Capitol Police, for example, that protect us in the Capitol are very good at threat assessment. We want to get that type of ability out to local levels. If there's about 12 or 13 of the unfortunate mass shootings we've seen in America where people knew of this person ahead of time and had reported a person ahead of time, we've got to do more on the front end. The other thing that we have been able to do is in the National in Instant Criminal Background Check System, states, for example, have what's called gun violence restraining orders that are put on people and if they uh, get on that list they can now be put onto the national instant criminal background check system denying them the opportunity to purchase a gun. Would you vote to ban bump stocks? Well you know the problem with anything like that is will it make a difference I guess is the question because experts have told me you can make a bump stock with a rubber band you can make a bump stock with some devices you can get at the hardware store for you know, just a few dollars. I'm looking at things from the healthcare perspective. I'm working with a Democrat, Dr. Raul Ruiz, an emergency room doctor in Congress, and together we're taking the approach of this is a healthcare issue, a mental health care issue, and we're trying to find things that are actually going to make a difference to prevent this type of thing from ever, ever happening. You are running for a fourth term in Congress, as we've mentioned before. Give us your proudest achievement so far. Oh, I think that uh, I can say I'm very proud of the changes that we've made at the VA, for one. So you get assigned to committees, right? And that's where the majority of your focus ends up. So I serve on Armed Services and the VA committee for the last six years. I'm now on Intelligence Committee. And I think the positive changes we've made in VA healthcare, uh, I'm very proud of, and in the VA system in general. You know, one of the things that we do within our offices is provide constituent service. And when people have problems with the VA, IRS, or any other agency, they can call us and we can intervene on their behalf. And we've had great successes helping people navigate the federal government. That's part of the representation. But I, I would say uh, taking care of the health of our veterans and uh, what we are able to do for our constituents. 
So you voted for the tax bill. The theory was that this would help the economy. Some say mm -hmm. it has, but that more taxes would be collected as a result, and that means the deficit would not balloon out of control. New numbers show that the deficit is up by 17 percent this year compared to last and could hit one trillion next year. Republicans are supposed to be deficit hawks. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do to curb that? Well, first of all, you can't cure any of this problem if you have a staggering economy. You've got to have a robust economy, and the tax reform has done that. Actually, revenues to the government right now are up. What it's going to take, seriously, is Republicans and Democrats coming together and saying we've got to address our mandatory spending. Mandatory spending is a part of our budget, and that's spending that goes out the door whether we legislate or not. 50 years ago it was at 34 percent, now it's at about 70. If we don't do anything, and this includes the interest on our debt, uh, then 2030 it will eat up the entire part of our budget. The, the other part of the budget is our national defense and national institutes of health, infrastructure, education, those types of things that you hear us debating all the time. We've got to step out of that arena as well because we have made cuts there and get over to the mandatory side. So let's be clear, are you suggesting that we should cut entitlements to bring down the deficit? I think we have to take a look at all of the programs that are in mandatory spending, look for waste, look for fraud, look for abuse, and make the cuts there and have something there for the next generation because as we're going right now, it's on the wrong track. But I will tell you with the tax reform and the increased revenues, we are funding Medicare and Social Security better than we were the year before. Can you name two entitlements you would be willing to cut in order to do that? Well, I don't know that you have to cut any of them completely. I think you have to maybe modify your system. I want these programs to be there for the next generation, and I want to keep the promises that were made to the people today. But you have to make some kind of changes within things and look at and, and make an asset review of how it's being operated, too. There are many ways to make cuts without cutting out the program completely. No one seems happy with health care. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Democrats, Republicans, and we seem to be stuck. You're a doctor. So what mm -hmm. ideas can you bring to the table, fresh new ideas that could help break through that logjam? Well, first of all, we have to start talking about it seriously across the aisle because it's become something that's just, just too polarized. We are all in favor of coverage for pre-existing conditions. Almost everyone I know knows somebody who has a pre-existing condition. We're all in favor of that and the 26 year olds to stay on their parents insurance. But as a doctor, there's no part about me that doesn't want people to have access to health care, quality health care and affordable health care. And, and that's what we're after. So I'm always looking at it from the doctor patient relationship and how we do that. We got to increase our transparency. You know, years ago, people used to know what things were going to cost when they went to the doctor. Now it's very difficult to tell, and it's very difficult for the office to tell somebody what something's going to cost. Okay, so, so you're talking about working together. Let's say the Democrats take control of the House. We're going to be a divided government at that point. There's a lot of talk. We need to work together. We need mm -hmm. to work together. But are you actually working together with, with Democrats to work on anything? At this oh, point? you can go through my record, and there's many things. You know, you look at the National Defense Authorization Act, for one, which is a big deal when you're on armed services. We pass that out of committee 60 to 1. That doesn't make any headlines when you get along. The VA Mission Act, and I talked about that being a great accomplishment and all that we did there. Every member of the committee co-sponsored that. I have bills. I talked about working with Dr. Ruiz on violence in America. I'm also working with him on the burn pits that were used in war. There's a lot of this that goes on. It just doesn't make the news when you work together with somebody. There's a lot of common ground. Over, I think it's over 80% of the bills that we pass are bipartisan. But Congressman Wenstrup, I thank you so much for coming in. Obviously, sure. we need to spend more time here. Come back again sometime. Thank you, you for bet. your time. And up next on This Week in Cincinnati, we're going to speak with Congressman Wenstrup's opponent. That is Democrat Jill Schiller. The people, the headlines, the issues impacting you. All on This Week in Cincinnati on 9 in Your Side.